Today we return to Sun Tzu's The Art of War. So far we've really just stayed on the first page. We've been talking about the five major factors and then exactly what's involved in this idea of method and discipline. But now we're gonna talk about how to actually conduct warfare, okay? How to really strategize. And in a military context, it's obvious what the significance of this is and people still read The Art of War for that, in fact, uh, in the Marine Corps, every single officer involved in the, uh, the first Iraq war was given a copy of The Art of War. Um, so military strategists still think that this is a very important work and, and study it in war colleges. Is it and not so. in the second Iraq war? No, that tells you something. We did really well in the first Iraq war and uh, somewhat less well in the second Iraq war. And this will explain why, by the way. So. Let's see some of the key factors that are involved in this. Now, one of them that is nice, <laughs> the key thing, in fact, if people know one quotation from this book, it's this one. All warfare is based on deception, okay? So all warfare, all conflict, you might say, is based on deception. As we've seen, in situations of pure competition, it is possible to actually have Nash equilibria. It is possible to have pure strategies work out. But what this is really saying is, in general, if possible, you want to use a mixed strategy. Now, often there are pure strategy equilibria as well as mixed strategy equilibria. So, for example, in the game we looked at right at the beginning about driving. We could drive on the right, we could drive on the left. We do well if we both drive on the same side. We do badly if one of us is driving on the right, the other is driving on the left. Now, there is another solution to that game. In addition to the let's all drive on the right, let's all drive on the left, Nash equilibrium. There is one that says let's flip a coin drive on the right half the time, left half the time. But it doesn't mean we both do, it just means you'd think, flip a coin, ah, heads, today I drive on the left, <laughs> okay? That would be very bad. And in general, in coordination or cooperation games, we'd rather have a pure strategy in Nash Equilibrium if we can, because we want the other person to be able to cooperate with us, and how do I cooperate if I don't know what's going on? Um, this, actually, this becomes a cl cliche in romantic relationships, you know, where the other person has no idea what the other person's thinking. Um, and there are all sorts of little memes that are meant to illustrate how bad men are at understanding women, or actually, they, they always go in that direction. Pretty sexist when you say something about it, but maybe appropriate. Uh, anyway, whatever it is, there is this sort of tendency to think, look, if I don't know what the other person wants, you know, so are you upset about something? No, it's fine. It's like, yeah, it's not fine, right? That means it's not fine, but, <laughs> but the problem is, well, what's wrong with it? And so um, if you're forced to guess and you're trying to coordinate or cooperate, that makes things harder. So you want to prefer a pure strategy where you know what the other player is going to do. But in this case, if we've got competition, pure competition, we generally don't want the other player to know what we're going to do. Now, sometimes you're in a position where, yeah, you have no other choice. But in general, you want to use a mixed strategy. And that means you want to rely on deception. So think about cases like that. I'm not now trying to coordinate with you. I'm trying to mess you up. So I'm the offense of the football team. You know, I'm the offensive coordinator. I'm trying to call a play. I don't want you to know what play I'm going to call. I want to mix it up. Now, in some situations, I realize you can probably pretty well guess, and the equilibrium is, you know, pure strategy. Um, it's third and 27. Well, what am I going to do? My options are limited, right? <laughs> Similarly, I'm on my own 10-yard line, I'm down by a touchdown, and there are 45 seconds left in the game. My options are limited. But for the most part, I want to keep you guessing. I want to use a mixed strategy. And the same thing is true in warfare. I don't want you to know what I'm thinking. I don't want you to know what my strategy is. So let's say you're running for political office. Do you give a speech right at the beginning of your campaign where you say, 
Here is my strategy for winning this election. I'm going to concentrate on winning Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, Pennsylvania. <laughs> no, you don't say that, right? You hope that your opponent doesn't figure out all of that until the very end. And so that's something that involves deception, involves basically using a mixed strategy, saying, hey, I might do this, I might do that. I'm going to keep it a secret from you what I'm doing. Now think about the history of warfare and think about things we think of as significant. They often involve this kind of, well, it's often just known as a surprise tactic, right? The bombing of Pearl Harbor was a surprise. The Japanese didn't say, remove this oil embargo or we're going to bomb Pearl Harbor. <laughs> it came as a surprise. Similarly, uh, now here, the Germans knew that Eisenhower was about to attack northern France in June of 1944. They, all these forces had been amassing in Britain. The Germans knew that. They had enough scouting. They had enough ability to uh, just be aware of movements that they knew a big force was amassing. So they were expecting an attack, but they didn't know where. And the most obvious place was Calais. Eisenhower did everything he could, including sending some troops to Calais that morning to try to make the Germans think that's where the attack was coming. But instead, it went to Normandy. And so it was an elaborate attempt to keep the Germans guessing and keep the mass of German forces over here while the attack came here. Something similar happened with the British assault on the Dardanelles in World War I except they got there and then wasted a week. <laughs> they actually had the element of surprise. They got there and then said, huh, nobody's around. What do we do? Eh, just hang out on the beach for a week. Not smart. Um, be the equivalent of the Japanese bombers going over Pearl Harbor and just buzzing it for a week before actually dropping any bombs. <laughs> um, so anyway, this will only work if you pursue the strategy correctly. But anyway, that's the thought. You want to deceive the other party. You want to keep them guessing. Think about poker, right? We talk about having a poker face um, or various tells. You don't want the other player to know if you've got a good hand or if you're bluffing. But it can be hard to do that. It's part of the reason I figure I should never play poker. Um, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, like, no, I, I'm not good at <laughs> hiding emotions in this way. So anyway, it's important that in these kinds of contexts, we keep certain things to ourselves. Now, there are other key bits of advice here. And I think they tie together in interesting ways. So that's one of them. The second one is this. Hold out baits to entice the enemy. Feign disorder and crush him. And that goes along with something that comes along later. Basically, you want to confuse the enemy. And so you are going to try to appear to be exactly the opposite of what you are. So what, what does that amount to? Well, you want to, let's see here. Um, and I'm trying to find the passage I want. I have too many things that are actually hmm, marked in yellow as important. But right, practice dissimulation and you will succeed is another one very similar to this. So how do we deceive? Well, one thing is, we try to appear the opposite of what we are. This is part of how we hold out baits for the enemy. So, he says, if you're strong, try to appear weak. If you're weak, try to appear strong. If you're confused, try to appear clear. <laughs> If you're clear, try to appear confused, OK? Um, and in general, try to appear to be the opposite. Um, <laughs> meanwhile, try to understand exactly what your enemy is and try to provoke weaknesses. So um, it, when able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must seem inactive. When we're near, we must make the enemy believe we're far away. When far away, we must make him believe we're near. Now, what are some examples of this in leadership? And again, you don't want to do this if you're trying to coordinate or cooperate with people. You know, hey, let's work together, and now I'm going to totally deceive you about <laughs> what I want and what I'm doing and so on. That's not going to work. 
but suppose we really are in opposition, then how would I, in an ordinary context, do this kind of thing? Seem the opposite. Yeah. Like if you're the CEO of a company that's not going very well, you don't want people that's working at the company to know that it's not going very well for our sake. So you want to appear like, hey, we're doing fine. We're just. <laughs> oh. Oh, that's right. Okay, good. So yeah, yeah, you're in fact not confident at all about things, but you want to appear confident, right? Uh, it's like, oh no, everything's going great. Um, yeah, that's an important thing. Yeah. I think the preeminent example that's happened very recently was Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes. Oh yes. The state blood testing and. Right, right. Oh, we're doing great. You know, the company's making tons of money. Everything's going fantastically, and so, and it's not at all. And so that is an example of, now notice, part of the problem there is that person is not supposed to be in an adversarial relationship with the public and with investors and so on. That's supposed to be cooperative. Um, this is appropriate for your enemy. It is not appropriate for, I mean, in fact, look, this looks pretty unethical, right? Here we are in an ethics class, and I'm telling you, lie, <laughs> mislead, <laughs> keep them guessing. Uh, try to be the opposite of what you appear. You know, it's like, wait, what? This is not usual ethical advice. Um, but this assumes we're in a situation of warfare, that we are actually trying to win something against an adversary who has absolutely opposed goals from ours. And unfortunately, that's part of real life. Let's assume that what you're doing overall is ethical. It's good, you're in pursuit of a good goal. There may be somebody else who's in pursuit of exactly the opposite goal and trying to defeat you. Now you might think, why would they try to defeat me? I'm right. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe they're evil. <laughs> maybe they just disagree about what the right thing is. Maybe it's simply that they have opposing interests. There are, as we've seen, moral conflicts. In fact, not only between the various dimensions of moral thinking we've been in identifying, but within them. Suppose we're thinking in terms of Virtues. Some virtues are opposed to other virtues, despite what Aristotle has to say, it seems to me. You can't be both decisive and thorough and cautious and so on all at the same time. You can't uh, be, well, what are some others? I mean, you can't always be merciful or kind and just at the same time. So all of those conflicts are possible. And you can be in pursuit of something that really is an important value, and somebody else diametrically opposed to you on this particular quest because they hold a different value. And they're both legitimate values. So in short, when you're in that kind of situation, you have to think, well, look, assuming my overall <laughs> pattern of conduct is ethical, suppose I'm on the right side and trying to win a just war. Well, this is how I have to do it. You had something? Oh, yes. Yeah, so I was going to say what you said was, um, but it was not with the uh, Well, that's true. If you're telling your competitors this, then it fits this pattern exactly. If you're telling your employees this, you know, you're not really supposed to be in a situation of conflict with your employees. Or if you're telling your investors this, etc. So that's a good example of where you might think, hmm, now this is sort of an ethical problem. With your own employees, notice, yeah, you aren't supposed to be in a situation of warfare with them. But there could nevertheless be reasons why you want to, what? Yeah, Have a mis a, an unjustified confidence? Yeah. <laughs> like you're in a merger, I guess. So say like, your company is valuable, do you think it should be? And ah, you're right. You're to get a bar from somebody, but you want to make them make it look like their value, your company should be value higher, so you'll get more when they actually do buy up your company, stuff like that, so. Right. OK, good. There are actually several circumstances, I think, short of outright warfare, where this kind of thing makes a lot of sense. One of them is the kind of situation you're describing, um, where you're involved in a negotiation, really. And bargaining is a different kind of thing. Bargaining isn't pure conflict. But on the other hand, it sort of is. It has some dimensions along which it is. If you're the buyer and the other person's the seller and you're haggling over the price, every additional dollar you have to pay is a dollar for them and vice versa. And so it is something like a situation of conflict. So a lot of negotiations have this character, even though you don't really think of it as warfare. It has a bit of this element. 
But the other one is a situation where, how can I put it? Why would the CEO mislead the employees about the prospects of the company? Because you think that improves the company's chances, right? If people are upbeat, they'll continue to work hard. Whereas if they think, oh, this company's going under, you know, it'll be like rats fleeing a sinking ship. Um, you know the aphorism, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Um, there's a wonderful and cynical book called Augustine's Laws, not from St. Augustine, but from Norman Augustine, who was the head of uh, a major corporation, uh, defense corporation, Martin Marietta, I think, for many years. And anyway, he has a variant of this he calls Lynch's Law, which is when the going gets tough, everyone leaves. <laughs> and so you might think, look, if we're even going to have a chance, I've got to keep these people on board. I've got to keep spirits up. Now, in some cases, this is actually something of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Often in medicine, people will mislead a patient about their chances for survival. And sometimes they think that can be pretty cruel, but often it really has a justification. Your chances of recovery are actually pretty good as long as you believe you're going to recover. <laughs> but if you start believing you're not going to recover, then you won't recover. And so, you know, what are your odds? Well, I can't give you, give you the odds, in a sense, independently of what you believe will happen. If you believe you'll recover, your chances are very good. If you don't believe you'll recover, your chances are very poor. And the company could be in that position, where it's like, look, I've got to tell the employees this, because then our chances are good. But they believe it. But if they don't believe it, we're sunk. Uh, and that can be a real thing. It has an odd character, because it's like a weird case of your belief making it so, really. If you believe you're going to succeed, you will. And often in real life, it's like that. Suppose you go to college and you believe you can do it. Your odds are way better than if you go in thinking, oh, oh, I, bet, I bet they're all smarter than me. I bet I can't do it. Right? Or you try the homework problem. <laughs> and you go in thinking, oh, I'm never going to be able to do this. That hurts your odds of doing it. Go in with great confidence. And then only when you find out it's misplaced should you have a kind of seek help. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, you want often, look, this, this is something that I'm assuming is in a situation of pure competition or pure conflict. But it actually can, in those cases, be ethically justified. Now, what are some other important principles? Let your great object be victory, not lengthy campaign. In fact, in general, conflict is damaging. So you don't want to engage in long conflicts. In fact, he says there are various strategies. The highest form of generalship is to balk the enemy's plans. The next best is to prevent the junction of the enemy's forces. The next in order is to attack the enemy's army in the field. And the worst of all is to besiege walled cities. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fight, fighting. So, we think here about a continuum. <laughs> here, no fighting at all. And here, well, some conflict is going on. Here, a long siege. Am I going to spell that right? Uh, no, there. You want to stay on this end, right? <laughs> Prefer this. Shorter is better. Now, why? He just announces this, really. The best thing is basically to win without even fighting, to make the enemy give up without a real conflict. The other, well, balk the enemy's plans, confuse them, basically screw up the plan so they don't know what they're doing and they can't implement their plan. The next, keep people separate, divide and conquer, basically. Don't let them amass their forces. The next, attack the enemy's army in the field. Oh, then you really have to fight. Here, prefer no fight. Or, and yeah, the worst of all is the long siege, where it's this long, slow, protracted conflict. Well, why? In a way, it's obvious, right? Fighting is damaging. People get killed. People get hurt. And in an organization, you hope it doesn't descend to the level of people getting killed. But nevertheless, it's damaging to the organization if these conflicts go on for a long time. So conflict is damaging in a variety of ways. So that's one consideration. But are there others? Yeah? Well, in sports, do like, you never want to go to like, overtime or like, let stuff like, go for longer because it is damaging and stuff like that? 
that, especially if you're playing like an opponent that's not as good as you, it gives them confidence that they can go longer with you, like in boxing. So Ooh. if you're like a champion and you're fighting somebody who's like an undercard, but they make it past the first round, they have confidence. If they make it to the sixth round, they have more confidence. So the, and if it goes to decision, they kind of have more confidence. Right. So okay, good. That's true. If you're in a position of strength, the last thing you want to do is give your opponent the sense that they've got a good chance, right? Everything that prolongs the fighting is encouraging your opponent. Yeah. It gives bystanders who might favor the weaker side, uh, but wouldn't do it if they knew that they were resigned to failure. It gives them a chance to reconsider their option. Yeah. By the way, Ooh, it does sound like the, uh, the people who wait a second if you're awkward didn't read this book, now that you said that. Oh, right, yes. Well, that's a good example. I mean, the first Iraq war, you go in, you win very quickly, right? It's a very short campaign. And indeed, that's part of what Schwarzkopf and Colin Powell had as their very explicit strategy. They grew up in the military ranks during the Vietnam War. And the Vietnam War was an example of this, <laughs> OK? And they basically said, well, we learned the hard way. Can't do this, OK? There are military reasons why you don't want to do this. There are reasons involving the enemy's morale and, and getting out alliances and getting help from outside and so on. The, more, the longer it goes, the more chance they have of putting together alliances and amassing forces and so on. But in a democracy, there's an additional problem. You've got to sustain public support for this effort over a long period of time. Even if it's not a democracy, you've got to su sustain material support for the army for a long period of time. You've got to get the army supplies. OK, you're cutting off. Let's say you're besieging a walled city. That's bad for the people in the city. But it's kind of bad for your army, too. What are you eating, <laughs> right? You've somehow got to be supplying your army during all this time that nothing's really happening. It's a very costly endeavor. And in a democratic situation, people tire of it. People you know, say, why are we still in Vietnam? We haven't won. Or why are we still in Iraq? Or why are we still in Afghanistan 17 years later? And so forth and so on. And um, I mean, it's even a joke in for the Princess Bride, right? Even before that, um, you know, what? How does it go? Um, Vizzini is saying, you know, oh, you've committed one of the classic blunders. Not as bad as getting engaged in a ground war in Asia. <laughs> Nevertheless, you know, uh, never go up against a Sicilian when death is on the line. And then he proceeds to die. But, <laughs> but you know, that idea of getting in a protracted land war in Asia, yeah, that's really, really bad. And where is Sun Tzu? In Asia. He knows already 500 BC, don't even get involved in a ground war in Asia. Very damaging thing. OK, so um, here is. <laughs> The key to victory, he says, there are five essentials to victory. He will win who knows when to fight and when not to fight. So I think that's a very important thing. <laughs> know when to fight and when not to fight. Here's the way it gets expressed ordinarily. Pick your battles. You are going to encounter in any kind of workplace, in any organization, a lot of people who strike you as idiots. A lot of the time, you'll be right. <laughs> OK, sometime you won't be right. You'll turn out to be the idiot. But whatever is going on here, you want to be careful about picking your battles. OK, fight when it's really important to fight about something. But sometimes you just go along with the idiocy. Now, that's sort of frustrating. and. It's frust I wanted to say there for a moment, it's frust most frustrating when you're young. Maybe that's just because you're still idealistic enough to believe you ought to <laughs> with every issue. Um, but maybe it's just, actually, by the time you get to my age, it's not that it's any less frustrating. You're just more resigned to the fact that that's the way the world is. Um, but however it is, you have to learn to pick your battles. In any, any management position especially, you're going to do certain things that make very good sense. Somebody's not going to like it. They're going to complain about it. They're going to fight you on it. And sometimes you should fight back. Other times you should say, you know what? OK, have your way. And it's a hard thing to know what really matters. One of my friends used to say this. You've got to know what really counts, what your chief goals are. And he said, look, 
Sometimes you should be willing to compromise. Sometimes, no, because the other compromises are made for the sake of this. So think about Aristotle. Some goods are sought for their own sake. Some are sought for the sake of something else. You have to decide what your real goals are. And then think, what's being done for the sake of what? And I think the key to knowing when to fight and when not to fight is to say, what really matters? Those are the things I care about for their own sake or because they're really central goals of mine. Those I won't compromise on. Other compromises are for the sake of that. But I will compromise on other things. So I think a key thing here, really, is to understand your, the main goals, the things you care about for their own sake, or at least for the, that they are the things that are most central to your part of promoting the good of the organization. Those are the things you sacrifice other things for. You make other compromises for, but you don't compromise them on those you fight. And indeed, he'll talk in a few minutes, we'll talk about his discussion of the various kinds of grounds. He says, look, on desperate ground, fight. Um, one translation has a, a death ground, fight. Um, otherwise, don't fight. But when it gets down to your survival, <laughs> when it gets down to the survival of the things that you're doing everything else for the sake of, then, yes, you're willing to fight. But otherwise, better not to fight. So we've got to be careful about picking our battles. I will give you the following hint. People matter, in the end, more than policies. Okay? If you have good people, they will do sensible good things, even if the policy around them is kind of misguided. <laughs> they will find ways around it. On the other hand, and I'm, I don't mean to say the policy is unimportant. Of course, it's important. But good people are going to make good policies. They're going to implement even bad policies in the best possible way. But bad people, it doesn't matter if you give them good policies to follow. They'll screw it up. And they're going to choose to enact bad policies to replace them. So the key points really are entry. <laughs> OK, if you've got an organization here, there's a question of, entry into the organization. And then, of course, there's a question of promotion within it. Those matter critically. Other things should be compromised for the sake of those, getting the right people, keeping the right people, promoting the right people. That's absolutely primary. Everything else is secondary. And if you are one of those people who hopes to gain entry or hopes to be promoted, well, tie what you're doing to those main goals. Make sure somebody's going to look and say, yeah, you're the kind of person we want. <clears throat> OK. Now, that's the first thing. Secondly, he will win who knows how to handle both superior and inferior forces. So you need to know how to deal with things when you're in a position of strength, but also in a position of weakness. So <laughs> one thing, you have to understand when you are in such a position, right? So you have to know when you are inferior, when you're superior. And you have to basically know your strengths and weaknesses. I'll put it that way. And how to use them. You can use your strengths, of course. You can even use your weaknesses. For one thing, you can hide them. When you are weak, appear strong. <laughs> but also, there are times when you want to appear weak. Um, there are times when you may be weak, and you can actually find ways of using that weakness to your advantage. So what would be an example of that? Somebody does have a weakness. Think about sports, maybe. There's a player who does have a weakness, but they manage to somehow convert that weakness into a strength. How would you do that? Yeah. An example could be Tommy Iommi, Tommy Iommi, uh, the guitarist for Black Sabbath. He, when he was a kid, he had like an industrial accident or something that chopped off the ends of his two guitar playing fingers or his oh, yeah. kind of pinky. And so he could really only play like basic power chords. And so they used that to create the dark sound that animates Dark Sabbath and made him so famous. They sort of did it by oh. circumstance or because they had to. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. That's an example of somebody taking a weakness and actually developing. <laughs> not, 
you might say not turning it into a strength, but in a certain way, actually using the weakness to their advantage. Yeah? Um, you can convince people that the fact that you have weakness and still so much confidence suggests that when you lose your weakness, you'll be stronger than the strongest. So that they should invest in you now to get the rewards later on. Well, that, that's a good point. Actually, um, <laughs> it's a common scouting strategy. Yet, let's say you're scouting various players, and you see somebody with excellent form, you see somebody with terrible form, but they run equally fast. Who should you pick for your team? The person with terrible form, because you can improve them. <laughs> the other person is as fast as they're going to get. And that same thing would be true in football or baseball or music or a variety of other contexts. You know, here are two employees. They both seem kind of equally good, but this one actually doesn't have all that much experience. You might think, well, actually, the fact that they seem equally good means maybe this person is a lot more educable. They learned, they got a lot more out of, out of that limited experience. So maybe they have a greater positive potential. Yeah, you had an example. Oh, yeah, I guess. Um, I don't know if this is fiction or true, but I think it was some Chinese war, and basically this one fortress, there was only like one guy in it, and he had like no reinforcement. There's like a whole army coming for that one fortress. But what he could do is play, like, I guess, like, I don't know what the Chinese instruments called. Oh, yes. Yeah. So like Mandolin or something like that. Oh, yeah. So he was like afraid for his life, but what he decided to do is stand at the very top of the fortress at the gates and just like relaxing and play the Mandolin as the army came. And as a result, the army was like, we shouldn't just back off and surrender. They're way too confident. They're going to push us. <laughs> that's <laughs> brilliant. That exact same, like, yeah, that's like, this is so I know exactly what you're talking about. That's awesome. That's a great example, right? You're in a weak, very weak position, but you actually, uh, I mean, I suppose that's an example of appearing strong. The, uh, look, we're so strong, we can just sit here and play musical instruments. We're not worried about you guys approaching at all. Uh, yeah. Yeah, in football, if you have, like, say you have, like, a weak defense, you, you know what they're going to do. They're going to run because they know you have a weak defense, so you stack the box. So it kind of helps you know their strategy. Because if you know that your weakness is weak, like, I guess to run, then you're going to know they're going to run the ball. That's a great point. If your weakness is known, then you realize, I know what the other player is going to do, right? I can actually get them. <laughs> I can lay a trap for them by getting them to do a certain thing. And then I know they're using that strategy because they know I have that weakness. Um, I might be a tennis player, to take a different analogy, who has a very weak forehand. But, and so I know you're going to try to hit to my forehand. But I realize you're going to be trying to hit that side all the time. So I position myself in the court to try to gain an advantage from that. And so I'm sort of using a weakness as a strength. Yeah. Um, I remember for a program, you were doing some personality test um, about your strength. And we're talking about how your strengths have like a weakness side to it. So like in a way, that, like the traits you have, it's kind of like what the uh, it's kind of like the world in me in a sense. Like, if your weakness has a corresponding strength. So, in a sense, like, kind of realizing that and being able to utilize the strength part of the weakness as we to consider too. Good, good. A lot of strengths have a weakness side to them. A lot of weaknesses have a strength side to them. And if you think about this the way Aristotle does, that's a natural thing. We're talking about means between extremes here being the ideal state, but suppose you're not in that mean. You're, you tend to this. Nevertheless, you're not going to be on the extreme end of that. You're going to have some strengths. And sometimes, at least, you'll be doing the right thing by leaning to that side. And so there can be cases where that actually helps you. Um, as you were talking, the example that came into my mind was President Trump. Suppose he knows, look, I tend to be kind of hot-headed. And <laughs> I tend to you know, speak off the cuff and so forth. How can I actually use that weakness to my advantage? Well, there is something in here that says, look, if your enemy <laughs> is irascible, irritate them, right? If they can be angered, anger them. So here's a way of actually doing that. I'll t instead of like hiding these reactions, I'll tweak them to the whole world, OK? That will piss off my enemies. <laughs> and while they're getting very upset about what I'm saying, that's going to be some momentary thing. Really, I'm interested in pursuing this goal. And so everybody's going to be talking about all this, oh, while I'm really doing this other thing. And so in a way, that weakness gets converted into something like a ma magician's, you know, 
watch this hand while I'm doing something with this hand. Uh, yeah, and it's, I'm not saying that's insincere. It's like, bah! But that's a way of directing everybody's attention to these momentary things instead of longer term strategic things. And so that's an example of that weakness having a bit of strength to it. Um, also, in a sense, as a, well, it, it, but notice what's going on here. It requires a level of self-understanding. And so all of this concludes in the following saying, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory, you'll also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you'll succumb in every battle. So you have to know your strengths and weaknesses. You have to know yourself. To really be guaranteed victory, you also have to understand your opponent. You have to know exactly how to take advantage of them. Even if you don't, you can at least go in prepared and have a, an even shot if you know your own strengths and weaknesses. But knowing yourself is absolutely key. All right, well, I'm taking lots of time on this, and I have not yet gotten to the types of ground. So let's talk about the types of ground. One of you was mentioning a lot of things here don't seem especially relevant, uh, and mentioned this as an example. <laughs> I actually think it's really important. Why? Well, the nine situations. There are nine varieties of ground. Sometimes you're fighting in your own territory. So think of it this way. We've got your territory. <laughs> We've got your enemy's territory. Sometimes you're over here. Okay? This is home. This is the enemy's home. Sometimes you're over here. You're in a secure position, in other words. You're in good shape. You're dominating the industry. Um, and you know, then, should you fight? Yeah, why would you fight, right? Things are good. So you don't have to worry about it. However, sometimes you've penetrated into hostile territory. Well, that, he says, is dispersive ground. There, things are getting tricky. Now, sometimes you haven't gone very far. This is facile ground here. <laughs> OK, you're a little in enemy territory, but not very far. You realize you're encroaching a bit, but not enough to provoke a very strong reaction, probably. Well, there's some ground that great, gives great advantage. So somewhere, this isn't just empty terrain. There are rivers. <laughs> there are mountains. Some of these matter. And think, sometimes you're going after something that's actually key, right? A key resource, a key vantage point, something like that. You have to understand when something key is at stake. So in short, know when your situation is fine, where your, your situation is strong. You're not being threatened. Know when it's a minor thing. Know when there's something that really is strategically important. Then, well, what other kinds? Sometimes you can move around free. That's open ground. Sometimes, in other words, you've got lots of options, and so does your enemy. So there's plenty of open ground here. It just means you've got lots of options. Other times, well, that's not so much true. They're intersecting highways. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means really sometimes there is a crossroads. There's a place where a key, for one thing, you're likely to collide there. That's a key issue, and everybody realizes it. But another thing is command of that is really important. So there are certain things that are key issues. And then, well, gosh, when you're in the heart of the country, it's serious ground. You've got people behind you. Over here, there is danger of increasing levels. Okay? Sometimes it's very difficult to maneuver. Sometimes, in short, you don't have many options. Sometimes, in fact, you're trapped. That's hemmed in ground. And finally, sometimes you're actually threatened with destruction. That's desperate or death ground. Now, what do you do? Here, Look, things are good, you're safe. Don't fight. Pick your battles. Don't fight about that. Um, here, look, um, don't fight, but on the other hand, don't give up. Keep going. This is a minor issue. It's a minor setback <laughs> or a minor conflict. Keep going. Now, on open ground, avoid conflict. 
Don't try to block the enemy's way. You realize you've got lots of options, but so do they. This is an unnecessary battle can arise here. So don't do anything that's going to cause a conflict. Here, where there are crossroads, alliances. This is where you want to make sure you've got enough people on your side. You've got enough people at that crossroads to actually do well. Now, the greater the danger, hmm, well, be careful. <laughs> when you're hemmed in over here, this is where you have to use strategy. This is where you have to use stratagems in particular. Here it's very important to deceive. It's very important to actually realize, all right, we're going into a conflict situation here. I've got to, I've got to gain an edge. And finally, on desperate ground, fight. You're not going to have any choice. But that seems to me absolutely key. It says, good leader <laughs> knows, try not to trap the other guy into having no choice but to fight desperately. On the other hand, when you're in that position, then fight and fight with everything you have. Or just quit. <laughs> That's what I did. 